M86 is a galaxy that has been observed for over 235 years, but in this time the actual structure of this galaxy has been a big unknown, some debating whether it is an elliptical or a lenticular galaxy. In data from the Hubble telescope, it has become clear that this galaxy is travelling towards us at such incredible speeds that it is literally pulling itself apart. It is being pulled towards what is known as the Great Attractor. What is this and how is this causing this to happen? M86 is part of the Virgo Cluster and is situated about 50 million light years from Earth. Oddly enough, the Virgo Cluster itself is actually moving away from our galaxy, but M86 is actually moving towards us. This is because M86 sits on the other side of the Virgo Cluster and is being pulled towards the centre of that cluster. It is not entirely clear what is causing this attraction, but the current best theory is that there is a large supercluster called the Vela supercluster which is gravitationally attracting these galaxies. But how do we actually measure the distance to this object then? Well this is a very good question. Redshift is often employed to measure distances but as this object is moving towards this, this is no longer possible. So how do we measure the distance to an object as remote as this when we cannot use redshift? Measurements depend on physical assumptions. So, do we recognise the object in question? Is that type of object the same across all of the objects we see? So, this type of galaxy, do we see the same types of these galaxies multiple times? And then, within that, what are we actually using to measure? Is that a consistent quantity? So there are a number of different ways that they can actually measure that. So here is a summary of some of the ones they could use in this case. There are other ones. So they can use X-ray bursts from neutron stars can be used because we know the intensity from or the average intensity from neutron stars and therefore can work out how quickly it falls off and therefore how far away it is based on the strength of the light that we receive tip of the red giant branch is another method that uses luminosity and in this case it is of the brightest red giant stars in that galaxy are then used as a sort of standard candle. Saved variables and nova. Uh, there is the Faber-Jackson relation which only really applies to elliptical galaxies and again we don't really know the structure here so this is not necessarily one you would use. And then type 1a supernova. It is claimed that it has a radial velocity of uh, over a thousand kilometers per second as well as the fact that it is moving towards us at 227 kilometers per second. It is also thought that this galaxy actually orbits the core every five billion years based on these velocity values. Now both of these measurements are obtained from redshift and blue shift data and are not actual measurements of the movement and this is a point that we will come back to in a bit. Now M86 is also an X-ray object and appears to be a weak radio source. So a plume of X-rays, hydrogen ions and infrared emissions from M86 suggest that its interstellar medium, so the material between the stars, has been swept back by what they call ram pressure stripping due to its motion through the intercluster medium, so that is the, the material between the galaxies itself. Other galaxies in the vicinity have also had their gas stripped in this way, but strangely their dwarf galaxies were unaffected. And these galaxies also seem to be moving together as a group with M86. The extent of the stripping varies greatly from galaxy to galaxy. Now ram pressure stripping is believed to be caused when a galaxy is pulled through the intergalactic medium too quickly. The particles in certain regions may be more dense and as the galaxy is pulled through these, a drag force is created which initially strips the gas in the galaxy and slowly distorts its shape. The problem is that not all of the galaxies exhibit this phenomena and they certainly don't all have a similar shape. And this also implies that the creation of the X-rays and the radio waves is down purely to these collisions. 
Some of the galaxies also seem to be replenishing the outflowing streams. No clear mechanism for this is provided. The electric universe concept is that these are acting like galactic comets. If the charge of the galaxy is different from the Virgo cluster core, this would cause it to start moving towards it. If we look at a comet that orbits the Sun, we know that the Sun streams out hydrogen ions which build up on the comet surface and end up being blown backwards. So in the case of the galaxy, could there be an outflow of ions from the cluster core which is being attracted to the galaxy and blown backwards by this cluster wind? It is an interesting concept, but I feel that it still presents some fundamental problems. If there truly is a cluster core, then where does it lie? For it to be producing these streams, it must be pretty massive. And you would also expect there to be some sort of a bow shock like our own heliopause, a range beyond which this would have no effect on the galaxy surrounding it. I also have an issue with the notion that different galaxies have different charges. I can see why they might have a different potential, but I struggle to see how they would have an opposite potential. You would also expect this pattern to occur in all directions from this core, yet it seems to be restricted to a very narrow path. Now it's true to say that we don't detect this ion movement, so if there is a core which is producing these ions, at the moment we can't see them. But we do know that detecting plasma is extremely difficult to do when it is in dark mode, so we can't rule out the fact that this may well be happening. So where does that leave us? Well, I must raise a question regarding the movement of the galaxies. All this data is based on redshift data. Now, I don't want to go into the detail here, but I have covered this problem with redshift data before in the past. It is very probable that a large part of the redshift is due to either intrinsic processes in the object or the plasma that the light is travelling through is causing a plasma redshift. For now, let's assume that it does show motion. So a big question of mine has been if this movement that we see in these galaxies is caused by intergalactic filaments carrying material from one place to another. At first glance, you would have to rule this out as a way of causing this type of action. It would require the galaxies to be accelerated at a faster rate than the material inside of that stream. One possibility might be that there is a flowing filament which intersects a neutral gas cloud, which would then cause this drag effect. This could also explain why certain galaxies are unaffected but are still moving relative to us. I find it interesting that astronomers take the leap to think that this galaxy is actually in orbit around the centre of the cluster, and that they project to a 5 billion year orbit. Let's be clear, the data we have does not show true motion. Only the fact that the light we receive is blue or red shifted, and they extrapolate based on what other objects are doing around this object to make assumptions about the movement but we don't actually measure it moving from point A to point B. Now, if we believe that there are indeed intergalactic filaments, the question is still if they carry material from one place to another. Do the galaxies move with them? We potentially see these galaxies moving, but at the moment we can't detect what is happening to the material in between the galaxies. Now if we examine the model for a galaxy, we see that there are filaments which move inwards and at the centre would sit a plasmoid which pulls the material inwards and may, as in Lerner's model, reform time after time. We also know that looking at the heart of our own Milky Way sits Sagittarius A and that there are stars which orbit this, so the question would be what happens to these stars when they reach an inflowing filament. A fair assumption would be that these would end up being pulled apart as the filament squeezes inwards and the stored magnetic energy increases. Is it therefore possible to apply a similar logic to galaxies? We know that there are vast filaments that crisscross our universe. Along these filaments is where we find galaxies and at junctions is where we find clusters of galaxies. 
we see that in our local cluster there is an overall movement in different directions. So in the case of galaxies, is the, the motion of these filaments caused by some sort of a larger plasmoid structure? So the question then becomes what causes the motion we observe in the local cluster of galaxies? In the case of galaxies, this inward motion of the filaments along the arms is caused by the formation of a plasmoid. So the question becomes, what causes the motion that we observe in our local cluster of galaxies? If it is the movement of plasma in the filament, which is moving along with the galaxies, then there must be a mechanism towards the centre which does something with the incoming material. The problem is that if there is a larger plasmoid structure, then we would see it, and we would see the material streaming into it. And it would be incredibly energetic, because you're scaling this up to an even larger scale. The, the problem is that the great attractor lies in a region which sits behind our galactic plane, making observations very difficult. So there could be something that we just can't see particularly well. However, the assumption that this structure should lie at the point that we see the movement coming together may be an erroneous one. If we look at the human body, the heart is responsible for pumping blood around the body. A vast network of arteries and veins join the whole system in a loop. We view our solar system as a closed system. We view a galaxy as a closed system. Is it therefore possible that our intergalactic system is connected in such a system driven by some larger structure? Again, I'm going back to the problem that we don't see this and the question would be what would drive it? It is possible that there is no driving structure, that the material is being caused to flow by simple contractions in plasma clouds which form filaments and transfer materials from one region to another. And this is how Alvin thought much of the material was carried from one area to another, and how large Birkeland currents could form. But what if the galaxies are not moving at all? What then? Well, then we have another mystery. The general assumption based on ARPS and others' work is that part of the redshift that we see is an intrinsic component. Now I don't want to go into the details of the different reasons for this, but let's just simply say that younger active objects are more redshifted and older ones more blue-shifted. Now this assumption works well with stars and quasars as they are singular objects. When you generalize to the size of a galaxy, this simple relationship doesn't really hold up as well. But younger galaxies will have more star-forming regions and older galaxies less, so this may cause a change when you average it out. But we need to add into this what the plasma surrounding the object and in between us is doing. Plasma redshift is something I have briefly covered in the past and is a process whereby a plasma can remove some of the energy from a photon and change its frequency to be redder. So is there something that could cause the photon to become bluer? Well yes. A well documented but not well discussed topic is something called photon acceleration in plasma. It is studied when using lasers but the applications apply to photons in general. This acceleration applies to both increasing and decreasing the wavelength so red and blue shift are photons, and it occurs when photons propagate in a plasma which changes in density. In particular, they focus on waves which propagate through plasma which has a variation in its density. When the plasma density increases, they will experience a blue shift, and when it decreases, a red shift. If the increase in plasma density is caused by an ionization front, this phenomena is called ionization blue shift. So could this be occurring here and in other galaxies which appear to be stretched apart? 
it is clear for some of the images that there are brighter regions at the front in what they call the bow shark. It is possible that this is an ionization front which is causing the blue shift. Is there some process going on inside the galaxy which is causing it to pull apart and causing a massive ionization of the remaining material? Why is there a clear channel where there is blue shift and a clear channel that is red shifted? One with density increasing and one with density decreasing. All galaxies that have observed ram pressure stripping are all blue in colour. Not necessarily blue shifted, but blue in their colour relative to the galaxies around them. Now astronomers try to account for this by suggesting that these galaxies contain younger stars which in their model means that they are therefore bluer in colour. But this makes no sense as if it is the gravity that pulls them in we would expect this not to be an ageist process. We would expect a, an even distribution of galaxies young and old to be pulled in and to have this stripping process. I think the colour is a clue as to the process going on inside of these galaxies that causes both the change in shape, the X-ray and the radio emissions as well as the bluer colour. Now one thing that I did consider is that Alvin viewed our universe as if it were structured like cells. Could it be that galaxies are able to shield themselves like a heliopause? And what if something could interrupt this mechanism or structure, allowing the material to simply leak out? Now one of Alvin's less talked about ideas was the notion that matter and antimatter may exist in equal amounts in our universe. He demonstrated that it could be kept apart by Leidenfrost layers. So could these be examples of antimatter galaxies whose Leidenfrost layer is collapsing? It's a pretty wild idea, I have to admit, but at this stage we cannot rule anything out. This humble little galaxy and the great attractor are certainly worth more investigation, as at the moment they throw up more questions than answers. It is these questions that will help us to understand the problems with certain models and will lead us to a better understanding of our universe. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.